Mr. Kam first called me and asked me to speak here. The goal of my presentation was pretty clear. Humor. I write a sarcastic blog. I talk about things like the metrosexual worship leader scorecard. You know, a white belt is plus two points. You know, for each pair of white pumas you own, you get three points. Um, you know, I write about silly things. But as I tried to write something funny about what's going on, I just had a really hard time. And I just, God is doing some crazy things. And so I know it's four o'clock on a Friday, and this would be the time for some humor. But I just couldn't do it. So instead, I wanted to share some of the stories from people, lives that are being changed, some of the actual comments I'm getting on the site, fan mail, that kind of stuff. So instead of what I had planned, I wanted to do that today, and I hope that's, hope that's okay. So it'll be a little serious, but I think it's, it's time. So this is just something I, I got on the site. Dear John, you are one of the most boring writers I have ever read in my entire life. Your attempts at humor are almost as pathetic as your grammar. Personally, I think you should kill yourself. Please let it be known that you are as boring as Ben Stein on lithium. Please refrain from ever wasting your time writing again. Can you feel the love? Mm. Just the embrace of culture wrapping around me tightly. The funny thing to me about that comment is that it was on a really controversial subject I wrote about, kind of one that's tearing the church apart right now. I was about Veggie Tales. I wrote a post called Baby Crack and Veggie Tales. And Baby Crack is obviously a reference to Baby Einstein because if you've ever had a kid, Baby Einstein is in fact Baby Crack. If you put that in, your kids are just locked. And although I admit that's not the greatest example of fan mail, it is a really good snapshot of what's happening with the site. I wrote something and got an unexpected response. This whole thing has been unexpected. It would be a huge lie for me to stand up here today and tell you how to do what I did because I didn't intend to do it. You know, I didn't have a plan and try to shift the paradigm and, you know, come up with steps. I didn't say, I want to start a small phenomenon. I didn't say, I'm going to tell 100 people and they're going to tell 100 people, and then in six months, 220,000 people from 93% of the countries in the world will have read my silly blog. Because that's not how it happened. But even though I didn't have a strategy, I had something more important. I had a story. And so does everybody in this room. You know, whether you want to start a church, or a ministry, or a blog, or a conversation with a friend, you already possess the most important thing when it comes to small phenomena your God-given story. So that's what I want to talk about today, is how do we do that? What does that look like? No formula, you know, no strategy. This is very much me reporting from the trenches. This isn't a, I'm done, I, you know, I figured this out. The first person that needed to hear this was me, you know, and I'm excited to share that. But I need to make a small disclaimer before I go on. One of the posts I did was about the Anything Goes Sunday, which is the Sunday before a major holiday. Like, this is the July 3rd and Monday is July 4th because they'll give anybody the mic on that Sunday. You know, like, that's when the associate minister that everybody loves but not on stage, that's when he gets to speak. You know, or the young, kind of edgy youth minister that they're trying to groom but he keeps getting in trouble, that's when he gets to go. Or the lady with the, that bought the rain stick on the mission trip, like, that's when she gets to do the solo and just, Like, that's her moment to just rock out. And so in this post, I suggested ways you could spice that up. One of them was, just practice your Christmas Eve service that day. You know, don't tell anybody. Just have the people that do show up get to experience Christmas on July 3rd. You know, do a dry run. Get it out of the way, because it's always so nervous in December to try to do that. You know, do it in July. Another one was throw Skittles. Because I thought, one, free candy. Like, who in an audience hates free candy? Two, what a great way to keep people engaged. You know, hit them in the head with candy. Um, and when I said that, I was joking, clearly, but a number of pastors did that. And then emailed me about that and about their Skittle experiences. And as I got ready for today, I realized, I'm that guy. 
You know, I've, I've been in marketing and I worked at a church communications agency 10 years ago called Details. And I know this industry a little bit, but I just have a blog. You know, there, there's a big who am I to this whole thing. Like, this is that moment. I'm the crazy youth minister. I'm the lady that's, you know, got a triangle that she just wants to share. I said triangle because we've kind of, we've retired cowbell. I don't, so I can't, I'm not going to use that anymore. And that's me. And it's Friday at 4 o'clock. Like, we're all collectively thinking about dinner and the airport and what we're going to do after. And we're all really full of just ideas. You know, we're already very full. So I'm going to take my own advice. I'm going to throw some Skittles today. So instead of transitions, instead of kind of unpacking a thought and writing this delicately woven transition, I'm going to do what I call Skittle segues. So in between points, I'm going to throw Skittles out. And it's going to kind of be a delicious reminder to you that we've just finished a point and we're headed into this rainbow future of the next point. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. So with that said, here's some Skittles. The first, the first idea about telling your story is tell your own story, not somebody else's. You know, my first eight drafts of this presentation sucked. They were sucktacular. And the reason was, when I sat down to write this, I didn't write my story. I wrote what I thought a good Christian speaker would say. You know, I go to North Point, so I started trying to channel Andy Stanley or Erwin McManus, and I got all worked up, and I thought, I'm going to need one of those little table and chair combos that come from Ikea or something. Like, I don't know where you get those, but they're hip and they're sleek. Like, my thought is that the guy that used to sell hymnals and choir robes has been forced to sell those, because we're all doing praise songs now. And, like, maybe it's a two-for-one, you get a fishbowl for the drummer and that little set. But like, where do they keep those during the week? Is it a special chair? Are the other chairs jealous? I just started going through all this and writing a story that wasn't mine. And it used to happen with my writing all the time. I remember about a year ago, I gave my wife a copy of a chapter of a book I'll probably never finish, because that's what we do. Um, and she read it in our kitchen, and she said, It's well written, but I think the whole thing's a lie. Which is awesome to hear in your kitchen from your <laughs> wife, by the way. Yeah, she's really been gifted with honesty as of late. But you know what? She was right. And the scary thing is, she's not alone. You know, our culture right now has such highly tuned lie radar, you know? Like, they can spot what's fake and what's true so easily because we've given them so much of what's fake. You know, in our advertisements, you know, we have advertisements for candy bars that tell women that they're going to give them a moment of serenity if you eat this candy bar. It's nougat. And I love nougat. I don't, you know, it's fun to say nougat. That's enjoyable. It's fun to eat, but you're asking an awful lot of nougat to give you a moment of serenity. Or motorcycle ads for men. How many times have you seen a motorcycle ad where it's freedom and your manhood and just unleashing who you really are lies in this motorcycle? But that's what we tell ourselves with our advertising, our entertainment, you know, flavor of love and the hills and Heidi and Spencer and all just this swirl of fake. You know, if you ask me right now, what's the easiest way to stand out? Be honest. You know, if the whole world is over here being fake, be honest. And the cool thing is that that's not us getting onto a trend, even though I think we're going to see honesty come back in the forefront. That's us doing what we're called to do. As communicators, as Christians, we're called to live the truth and be the truth. You know, and that's, that's really cool. And when you do that, when you start to tell your story honestly, you start to learn some cool things. One of them is that honesty is more important than talent. And that's, that's hard to hear. It's hard for me to hear because I, I worry that I'll say that and then there'll just be more Jesus junk. You know, I encourage people to create more Adidas becomes Ad Jesus and stuff like that. But I really think it's true. And the reason it's true is that we right now as a culture have access to more talent than we ever have in the history of mankind. Think about the mediums that have bubbled up good stuff to us. You know where your favorite blog writer was writing 20 years ago? In their diary. You know where that band you love that you found on MySpace was? They were in their garage. You know, that short film director you love on YouTube? That, that lady was in her basement. 
You know, but because of the medium changes, we've been exposed to a ton of talent. But nobody in this room would say that in the last 20 years, our honesty has increased along the same path as our talent. And so right now, the talent pool is really full. You know, there's a lot of people in that. And the honesty is really empty. You know, it's really empty. So don't wait on talent to tell your story. You know, that's often one of those things that stops us, is I gotta be talented enough to tell it now. Start with honesty and see what God does with that. And the second thing that's really cool about honesty is that it's contagious. When you tell your story, other people jump in too. One of the things I like to talk about on my site is my experiences with Christian counseling. Because there's still kind of this stigma that Christian counseling is for really messed up people. Which is funny because it is, it's just that we're all really messed up. And I, I've gone to four different counselors in the last ten years, which makes me kind of a pro. Um, I've developed really good counselor lobby etiquette. Um, like, one of the things you shouldn't do is kind of play that game where you sit there and try to guess what the other guy is in there for. You know, and you're like, oh, eating disorder? No. Marital problems? Oh, what's he in here for? Don't, don't do that. You know, focus on the magazines, which are going to be horrible. And they're horrible because the counselor doesn't want to trigger any issues in anyone. So, like, you can't even have good housekeeping in there because they might have a tankini. You know, somebody running down the beach, which tankini, the Christian bikini, if you're not holy enough to rock the t-shirt, solid colored t-shirt over the bathing suit, which is the holiest of all and Jesus loves the most. <laughs> but so you're going to have these horrible magazines, like 1987 Yachtsman, because unless you have like a nautical problem, that's not going to have somebody in the counselor lobby going, oh, this is triggering me. And when you call up, don't tell the secretary you're junk. She'll say, hey, you know, what's this appointment in regards to? That's not the person you spill your story to. Just say stuff, you know, life. Just want to be better. You know, that's great. Or if we see each other and you recognize me from the lobby and we're across the hall at Walmart, you don't have to yell. Like, we're good. You don't have to be like, how are those dad issues? Are you unpacking your stuff? Are you using I statements, not you statements? How are your boundaries? G good? Okay. Little, little ear, you know, tug. I'll know you. We'll know each other from counseling. That's fine. And as I've shared that, other people have jumped in with their stories too. Because what happens is when you go first with your story, you give everyone in your community, in your church, in your blog, the gift of going second. And that's huge. That is gigantic. Because it's so much harder to go first, and it's so much easier to go second. But that's what we have to do. We have to give people the gift of going second. And we have to throw ourselves on the honesty grenade and tell our own story. Here's some Skittles. That one's going to hurt somebody, but that, kid, that guy was waving, so, and he's probably Twittering, so I want to make sure it's a positive comment. So I'm going to, you know, if I see anybody with a laptop, you're probably going to get Skittle preference. I'm just going to be honest. The second thing about telling your story, we got to make our stories bigger. I used to write for this uh, stereo company up in Massachusetts. They make high-end home theater systems and little radios that sound like an orchestra. And the founder used to really get mad with guys like me, writers, because he would say we made his brand small and boring. And what would happen is that he would tell us, you know what, my brand is like this soccer field. It's this massive, huge area. And it's got borders that go on and on and on. And I want you to play in those. I want you to tell my brand story using all this room. But what happened is that when he would tell his number two guy that brand and ascribe it to it, that person would draw the borders just a little smaller because he didn't want to get too close to that edge. You know, speaking of edge. And then when that number two would tell the number three person, just a little smaller. Number three to number four, just a little smaller out of fear. Until by the end, when it got to me at my level, which was low and continues to be low thus far, thank you, I didn't get a soccer field. I didn't get this. I got a postage stamp. And they'd hand me that and say, make this interesting. And it was really hard. It was really hard to make this amount fun and exciting. And that's the same thing we do with God and our stories. God wants to use our whole life to tell our story. You know, he gives us his soccer field. And we start to make it smaller. For me, it's stuff like, 
Okay, okay, here's my story, God, but mm, I don't want to be that weird guy at work that says hallelujah when the printer doesn't jam or, you know, finds a way to work Jesus' name into the answer of every question. How are the Q1 results? Oh, they're great, sweet baby Jesus. They've really come up, you know. I don't want to be that guy, so I'm going to take work off the table. And I think it's a little smaller. I say, oh, marriage, ooh, there's some things I've rushed over in premarital counseling. I'd rather not go back to that. I mean, they're still affecting us, but I don't want to go in there and dig around. So I'm going to take marriage off the table. Ooh, my friends. There's still some guys I get together that I like to cause a ruckus with. I mean, I'm the Christian in the circle, but I join in to an extent. Uh, Let's take that off. Ooh, my goals, my dreams. I want to give them to you, God, but you're going to send me to Guam or Africa. I just know it. Like, I know as soon as I give you my dreams... I'm going to be in a hut. It's going to be like zero to hut in like two seconds. And I can't do that, God. So let's take that off the table. And slowly but surely, they get smaller and smaller. And we say, okay, God, you can have nine to 12 on Sunday morning. And I want you to do crazy things in it. That's your time. Like, you go all out. Make it awesome. Wicked awesome, even. I don't know if I can say that to you, but wicked awesome. And then we hand him this postage stamp. And then we wonder why our stories are small and kind of dull. And the reason I do that is I'm insecure. You know, I auditioned a lot of shirts for today's outfit. Um, I'm going to be up front with you. Um, the shirt, and you can't see it there, and that's a hilarious, that photo is me behind our house with my digital camera, my wife. Like, that's just, you know, costs about a nickel. But in that photo, I'm wearing a white T-shirt, and it's like a dirty Hanes white T-shirt. And I thought, is that my brand? Like, should I wear that at the conference? And if that's my brain, am I becoming like the Christian Fonzie? Like, <laughs> like, is that where this is headed? And will I jump the shark if I do wear it or if I don't wear it? Oh, and then, you know, what degree of product do I want to use? Like, how metro am I taking this? Oh, I wore these shoes, the white pumas, to look kind of sleek and fast in case I got nervous. And I practiced in them, in our living room, with just a friend on the couch, me in shorts, tube socks, and these shoes, just to kind of get a feel for them, make sure that they're working the brand right. And these are the things that went through my head, just with my clothes for today. So imagine how insecure I am about writing. You know, I've never felt like a real writer, whatever that is. You know, we create these definitions of what's real or what's perfect that are fake. And I've always been insecure about my worth, but now with a blog, I have tangible evidence of how good I am. You know, I can go to Google Analytics and measure my worth. I can go page views. Oh, how many countries are coming? How many unique visitors? Return traffic. How long are they staying? You know, and just get all sweaty. And then Technorati is the worst one. I don't know if you're familiar with Technorati, but it ranks blogs from 1 to 112 million. And I know exactly where I am on that. And I became like a gambling addict with a slot machine hitting refresh. I was like, come on, change. And you know everybody else in your, like, I know where Ann Jackson is on that list. I know where Ragamuffin Soul is. You start to know everybody and you get really kind of worked up about it. And comments are even worse. If I write about marriage and I only get like 40 comments, a couple months ago I'd write something else to put that on top of there. They're not laughing. I've got to write another post and another and another to kind of cover up the marriage mistake and make that part of my story smaller. Or they're not feeling family. I've got to take that out. People aren't expecting that i got to be careful about their expectations. You know what happens when you get worried about people's expectations? You don't make your story bigger with God. You make it better with yourself. You start to exaggerate things and shine up stuff that's not really there. And you, like, Have you ever been in a small group with one of these people that have an exciting testimony? You know, it's like they've got like a Jason Bourne testimony, like a car crash and like, there's a fireball and like a drug addiction and just all this crazy stuff. And you just sit there like, oh, I became a Christian when I was in fourth grade. I didn't have a chance to really mess up. It's just not exciting. I wish it was exciting. And you get that temptation to exaggerate. But for me, it's been exaggerating about Donald Miller. My, uh, my parents know Donald Miller. A few years ago, before Blue Like Jazz blew up, he came and spoke at my dad's church and stayed at their house for a few days. I've talked to him one time for about 15 minutes. But to hear me tell that story sometimes, you would think I saved Donald Miller's life in Nam. 
you know? Like maybe he and I have matching tattoos that say Ride Us Forever with the number and then EVA. And there's like a sunset and maybe like a palm tree. And every time we run into each other, we go, oh, Ride Us. And we like bump them or something. It's ridiculous, but that's what I've done, you know? And I exaggerated that, which is a fancy way to say lie. I lied about that. You know, And so what do we do when we're caught there? When we're caught between trying to make it bigger or better with God or with us, you know, and just caught in our own expectations? I think what we do is we tell them to God so that he can then laugh at them. And I mean that in the best possible way. Because he's going to. He has to. Like his ability to tell our story is so much crazier and wilder than what we can imagine that when we tell him what we think is going to happen, he can't help but laugh. And it happened to me a few weeks ago. I was jogging and kind of running around the neighborhood, and I confessed to God, said, God, I want my story to give me fame. And that's not a fun thing to announce, but that's what I said. And I said, I want it to give me fame. And I felt like he said to me, and well, I'm not really sure if that's what I should say. I don't know right now what we're saying that doesn't make us look weird. Like, is it he laid on my heart? He impressed on me? I felt like he reminded me. Whatever the one is that doesn't make you look like a wacko. Like, that's the one that happened. So I, so I said, I want fame. You know, I want my story to give me fame. And, and he, he said, ha, fame? The Alpha and Omega knows your name. The creator of the universe knows who you are and what you care about. That's as famous as you're going to ever get. You know, whose acknowledgement of you is going to line up next to mine? Oof. And so I kept jogging, and we laughed, and laughed about it. And I didn't get to know his expectation, but by confessing mine, I got to stop trying to write my story to get fame, which was making it really small and pretty boring. And I got to rest in the peace that no matter what happens with a book, or if I ever get asked to another conference or anything else, it doesn't matter. I'm already famous in God's eyes, and that makes my story a whole lot bigger. Here's some Skittles. Oh, you're asking an awful lot, Brian. Oh. Oh. It'd be cool to get a minute. Whoa, rejected. Yeah, ooh, God hates that. Yeah. I'll pray for you. These were to bless you, but apparently you don't want blessing. <laughs> the third and last idea about telling your story is that you have to get messy. You know, the best stories, the ones that travel faster than gossip, the ones that light people on fire and communities on fire, they're messy. They're sloppy and complicated and ugly and beautiful and all these things wrapped into together. And the fastest, easiest way to get there is to invite other people into your story. Because you lose control of it. I mean, ultimately, it's God's story. But you really tangibly lose control when you allow other people to jump in the conversation, too. And that's not easy. I mean, for me, that's an ego thing. Like, I want to be the funniest guy in the room. You know, I want to be the most insightful, you know. And so, early on in the blog, I realized a lot of the comments were funnier than the post I had written. And that was a, a tough pill to swallow at first, you know. Because I thought, hey, what about me and my needs and meh. But I realized that I needed to invite other people in so that they could share their story. And so I started to do that. And I started by mentioning that people should read the comments. And I started copying and pasting them into the posts. And then I started writing open-ended posts. And one of them that I did where I invited people to tell the rest of the story was about sound guys and girls. I wanted to kind of celebrate one of the most unappreciated people in the church, the sound guy. You know, because they have one of those jobs that if it goes well people don't notice, but if it doesn't, everybody does that thing where they turn around and look at the sound booth. <laughs> don't make me regret that post. I'll, I'll, delete, I'll delete it right. It's not a book. I can just delete it. But they'll turn around and say, do you not see that? Do you not hear that? Do you hate Jesus? That's it. You hate God. And so I wanted to celebrate that. 
And so I did that in the form of haikus. I wrote something called Sound Guy, Sound Girl, Haikus, the Japanese poetry, where it's five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second, five syllables in the third. And I wrote a couple, and they were okay, but they weren't great. And the reason they weren't great was that it's not my story. You know, I enjoy sound guys, but I've never been one. And so when, you, when I wrote them, you could tell that they weren't great because of that. But I got some from people that were really kind of neat and really showed me what sound guys are really thinking about people like me and people like anybody in a pew. So I wanted to share a couple of those because I, I thought they were pretty cool. All right, here's one. The band sounds awful. Quick, fix it, sound guy. I can't. Talent switch is broke. <laughs> the guitar was loud? That's right. He is your husband, who can't really play. <laughs> you say it's too loud. He just said it's too quiet. Please make up my mind. This is a nice little, this one the guy actually wrote like four. It's a kind of fantastic little voyage. Did you turn it up? I lie and say, I did not. We make a great team. <laughs> this song should not rock. Well, I rock it anyway. We make a great team. <laughs> Your guitar seems loud. I haven't even played yet. Okay, I just lied again. Sometimes less is more. Sometimes I flip you the bird when you turn your back. <laughs> Did you flip me off? No. Why do I lie so much? We make a great team. And here's, here's the last little set. Arrive too early to set this stuff up again. Tired of doing this. Everything's set up. Been in sound check for an hour. All sounds perfect now. Pastor shows up now. Tells tech guy what sounds bad. Has no music ear. Want to punch in face. Because I was up early. Just want to sleep in. I love those because they're messy. You know, it, how often do you get to hear a sound guy saying, I just want to punch the pastor in the face. You know, or I can't make your husband sound good at guitar because he doesn't. Making him louder is bad. I am giving him the gift of silence. He needs to embrace that and appreciate that. You know, and the other thing about those that I like is that they're funny. There's kind of this idea that to do something big for God's kingdom, you have to be serious. You know, and, and I've heard people say, well, God's not sarcastic. He's very sarcastic. When he asked Moses... Is, is my arm not long enough? Does God not know? Is he asking Moses for an answer of, you know, how long are my arms? No, he's being sarcastic. He's having fun. You know, and it, but you get this idea that to do something great for God, you have to kind of have that whisper of importance. You have to kind of get down and just really pour into somebody, you know? Just love on them. Build a hedge of protection, you know? Or as a worship leader, you try that little trick called talk singing where you just start talking and then you trick us into the middle of a song and it's like we didn't even know. And it usually looks like this, you go. And this is my imaginary guitar, by the way, because the rain stick, I've already done that once. <laughs> Although I love that. But you start with this guitar and you say, you know, my wife and I were having coffee this weekend just talking about our problems and we just realized everyone needs compassion, <laughs> the kindness of a savior. And it's like all of a sudden we're in a song. Like you got us there and it was serious and it was beautiful. And I got kind of caught up in that as I prepared today. I was like, I want to be, you know, important and I want this to be big and I want to be like the Christian little Wayne and prolific. And I want to be like, you know, which is a weird thing to be, I know. Or like, maybe I should be like Eminem. This is my one shot and I should throw the mic at the end and just walk off the stage, you know, or end it with this comment from an atheist because a lot of atheists are engaging with the site and it's a really cool thing. And I'll just do that really serious. I'll be like Michael Jackson at the end of Man, Man in the Mirror, you know, which is a great youth group skit song from like the 80s or 90s. That and Gloria Stefan's um, Coming Out of the Dark. But Man in the Mirror ends and you can just be like, make that change. I thought, I thought maybe that's what I'll do. Maybe I'll just tell everybody at ministry, come, make that change. You know, and they'll think I'm just smart and insightful. And in the midst of that, in the midst of worrying about that, I felt like God reminded me, he doesn't need me. You know, that wasn't fun to hear at first, but he doesn't. He doesn't meet, need me. He loves me. 
And there's a huge difference between those two things. Need is about a business partnership. Love is about a relationship. He doesn't call me into things like this because he needs me to add something. He calls me in it because he knows I'll enjoy it. And he enjoys seeing me enjoy things. You know, and that takes the pressure off. And he can work through me and without me at the same time. Has that ever happened to you? You know, you've planned something. You've been so focused and you know exactly how it's going to happen. And you know who it's for and why you're doing it and what the results are going to be. And then it doesn't happen. It blows up. The video doesn't render right. You know, the graphics aren't there. Something happens. And you think it was a failure. It was a failure what we tried to do. But then God gives you a little glimpse that he had something different planned. And he was just working through you and without you at the same time because your head was in a different place. And I happened to a friend of mine the other night. I called him up. And uh, we hadn't talked in a while. And it was a Tuesday night. And he answered me. He just said, oh. I said, what's going on? Where are you? And he said, I'm backstage at a conference. This conference flew me out from North Carolina all the way to California. And my one thing, my one job was that I prepared a, a two-week-long video editing kind of exercise to show this video I created about a skid row ministry. And all I had to do was intro it and press play. And when I did that, when I got to that point, the audio wouldn't work. And so he stood there. And he did that sweaty run we do where it's like you run from here down to the audio booth just to make sure they know you want sound. You know, like, I don't know if you didn't know, but this video has music and sound too. Okay, okay I'm going to go back up there. And you run back and forth, and he just got really worked up. And then he remembered, he had brought two guys from the ministry with him. And his phrase was, they were semi-homeless. And they were kind of rough guys. And they're not the kind of guys you usually find at a conference. And so instead of showing the video, he just handed them the mic. And those two guys got to come up there and kind of tell their testimony and tell their story and share. And even though it was only 20 minutes away from that horrible feeling, he said, you know, I almost wonder if that's what God wanted all along, you know, was to give those two guys a venue. You know, and I should have just rolled out the carpet for them right from the beginning. Does God always work that way, you know? I hope not. I think that, you know, the soundboard can be the devil's playground. But will he mess up audio if that's what he wants to do to tell his story? Without a doubt. Because it's his story. We just get to enjoy it and be messy, which makes it a lot more fun. Here's some Skittles. Those are going to hurt because that was high. That, was high yeah. that one was going to sting a little. It'll be a ministry con bruise. That'll be great. Tell your story. Make it bigger. Get messy. Story's pretty simple when you think about it. The simplest thing is that you can start today. You know, it took me a little while to learn that. It actually took me a girl that I was a jerk to to learn that lesson. A few years ago, there was this girl I worked with named Hannah. And we just did not get along. And I was a jerk to her. I gossiped about her. I would take the stairs instead of the elevator to avoid her cube. And I just did not like Hannah. And in the midst of that time, I was working on a book. And I was praying to God. And I said, God, please use this to bless people. And I felt like he said, Hannah's people. And it was, oh, he was so right. I thought that to tell my story... I had to be looking out the window over the horizon for far off countries and far off people. Meanwhile, I had this whole world behind me that I wasn't telling my story to. The world I already had, I wasn't telling my story to. So don't make the same mistake I made. You know, start telling your story tonight with the people you have dinner with. You know, go home tomorrow and tell your kids part of your story. Tell your wife or your girlfriend or the coworker that you want to kill on Monday morning some of your story. You know, don't wait for a big phenomenon. Because even though sometimes a single life change feels like a small phenomenon, that's God's favorite kind, you know? And when you do go home and you start telling your story and have fun, let me know about it, you know? I'd love to stay in touch. I know that's kind of a stock thing you say at a conference. Like, it's like the prom that way. Like, we're going to be together forever, we're best friends, you know? And you take the photos and then you go back and you never talk again. I don't want to do that. That's why I handed out my business card. You know, it's got my email address on there. When you go home and you tell your story, let me know about it. You know, I'd love to get messy with you. I'd love to talk a little more about the most important thing when it comes to small phenomenon, your God-given story. Thanks.